Hi and welcome to another Technalysis video. My plan going into this was to get a good look at Auto HDR on the Xbox Series consoles because I wanted to figure out if that's a feature that I want to keep enabled or not. Somewhere along the way I realised that the best point of comparison that I had was actually the PlayStation 5 and the scope of the video crept up and up and now it is a pretty full on look at the backward compatibility features of both consoles. <laughs> uh oh, comparing consoles. Um, I'll say right now if you've come looking for console war ammunition, this is probably not the video for you. There's barely a frame rate or pixel count to be found in the whole thing. If you're here because you find the technology interesting, then stick around. I can tell you now that both consoles surpassed my expectations, so there's some good news coming. And yeah, fire exits to your left or your very left, and let's get into it. Alright, so first of all, I need to talk a bit about high dynamic range, or HDR, because like I say, it's what I started this video looking for and understanding it is pretty fundamental to the rest of the video. So HDR refers to an expanded colour space, it's a wider range of colours in every direction, so you get more diverse, more accurate colours, greater contrast and additional detail in the dark areas as well as much higher peaks in the brightness. It's a relatively recent technology, uh, it only really arrived midway through the last console generation, which is why it's a bit of a mess. So high dynamic range brings a lot of challenges or teething problems. Um, because standard dynamic range content, so the old stuff that came before it, and high dynamic range content do not mix at all and translating imagery between the two ranges is really really complicated and you can't display them side by side or at least not on one screen and that makes demonstrating the difference really damn hard. Okay, so hopefully you're still with me. Everything in this video has been captured from the consoles at 4K with HDR enabled. None of these games were made with native HDR, so, uh, so the two consoles are using their own respective tricks to output a 4K HDR signal to the TV. I've used an external capture card to catch that signal as authentically as I can. And if you have the option to watch it with HDR on YouTube, then what you're seeing is the best representation that I can offer of what PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X output to an HDR TV. If the screen that you're looking at right now does not support YouTube's HDR, then you'll be seeing their best tone mapped interpretation of it. Um, so Google servers will kindly translate all the colors as best they can into the standard range. And it does a pretty good job of it. It looks quite nice, but it's literally impossible to squeeze the expanded color range down and still represent all of the colors perfectly. And um, you will it, it will crush out quite a lot of the detail from the extreme, so those bright and those dark areas. So basically, just be aware that you can't entirely believe your eyes. Right, so that, um, that's a challenge for me in how to display this content to you, but it's very relevant because it is also the challenge that Microsoft and Sony have had to overcome with their consoles because these consoles display standard dynamic range and high dynamic range, and they, they, handle, them, they handle the two types very differently. Okay, so on the Xbox Series console, the dashboard and the operating system, that actually operates in the standard range. So when you fire up the Xbox, you get um, a standard definition picture. And if you launch a game or an application that supports HDR, then that output changes and you'll probably see your TV screen flips off for a second. It comes back up in its, uh, in its HDR mode. Okay, so the Xbox doesn't support SDR and HDR at the same time. It has a very distinct kind of flip between the two. Uh, and one of the console's backward compatibility features is Auto HDR. Uh, Microsoft talked about it quite a bit. So Auto HDR is enabled automatically for most backward compatible games. And uh, Microsoft's explanation is that it uses artificial intelligence to add or inject HDR into games that didn't initially support it. And it's a bit of a risk because um, it kind of deviates from what was designed and tested. So you might, for example, have a character walking around with a white shirt and that shirt might glow as bright as the sun because the um, the AI is just seeing white and expanding it to the, the high dynamic color space. So for that reason, and that's actually a specific example that happened in Grand Theft Auto 5. So Microsoft have gone in and disabled Auto HDR for certain games that people have identified problems with. Okay, so as has been pretty typical for these consoles, Microsoft were, were very loud and very transparent and they told us exactly what their console was going to do in this area. Sony, by contrast, didn't really say anything at all about it. In fact, for a long time, people didn't even think um, they were going to get backward compatibility for more than 
more than the top 100 games. As it turns out, PlayStation does support backward compatibility for almost the entire PlayStation 4 catalogue and it handles it quite differently to the Xbox series. So the PlayStation's dashboard runs in HDR and the PlayStation 5 does not come out of HDR for anything. Um, it has a system level tone mapping feature in there. So if you've got your PlayStation 5 up and running and you launch a game that does not support HDR like Bloodborne, you, you won't notice your TV switch off. It doesn't flip out of HDR mode. It runs the game. It translates it into the HDR color space as best it can. And it just runs smoothly. Now that might sound great, but while, while the Xbox solution leaves the presentation of the games in the hands of a relatively low cost AI, the PlayStation approach does have some drawbacks of its own. Um, and Bloodborne, again, gives a nice demonstration. It's a very dark game. It has a brightness slider in the options. And if you set that brightness slider down to its very minimum value, it's actually not dark enough to, to hide the icon that's supposed to be hidden. So it's not perfect, but when it actually came to, to getting into Bloodborne and playing it, I had no complaints. Dragon Age Inquisition's title screen actually makes a good example of the differences between the two systems. So you can see um, the sky hits peak brightness here and the, the dark robed sorcerers provide a really strong contrast. And if you're watching this with HDR, um, then you can see that the Xbox picture is a bit richer and a bit brighter overall, um, but it maintains those dark levels. And the result is just a slightly more vibrant picture than you get on the PlayStation. It works really well, um, but the scene also shows an obvious limitation of both methods as the, the sky is at peak brightness. And in a native HDR game, you could embellish that area with a lot more subtlety and a lot more detail. Um, but the detail just doesn't exist in the original scene. So what we get is this glaring bright spot. Now that's not a massive problem. You're not losing anything from the original presentation in either case. But if you are the kind of person that likes to stare at the sun, you might have a better time doing it on real HDR games. Right, that's definitely enough about HDR. So next I'm going to go over the range and the features that each console brings to the table. On the Xbox side, you get to play almost all of the games that released on the Xbox One. Uh, the only exceptions there are games that were made for the Kinect because Microsoft have filed a restraining order to keep Kinect away from their brand image. Um, you've also got access to almost 500 Xbox 360 games and even 38 games from the original Xbox. So the games from those older consoles rely on patches from Microsoft's backward compatibility team. But if they are supported, then you can just pop in your disc or get it from the, um, the digital store and download the updated version. The good news there is that um, the console offers some seriously cool enhancements for those older games. Auto HDR applies right the way back to those original Xbox titles and the Series X brings some other enhancements as well. You've got the, the raw power and the speed are part of it, but we'll talk about that later on together with the, the PlayStation, which does a similar thing. Uh, more specific to the Xbox are resolution enhancements for those older generations and some fancy texture filtering across the board. Um, I won't go into the specifics of anisotropic filtering right now because this video is getting pretty long already, but the result is that old games look true to the original design, but much more clean and much more crisp. Uh, you can take a look at the results on a game as old as Fusion Frenzy uh, that was released back when teleboxes were a standard 4x3 ratio. And yeah, um, it looks great. So Perfect Dark is another good example. Uh, that's from the Xbox 360. It was a launch title for the Xbox 360. And the enhancements make a massive difference. Microsoft have also spoken about um, a feature to double the frame rates of select games and they demonstrated it with Fallout 4. But as you can see, that's not live yet. Fallout 4 is still running at 30 frames per second. If they can pull that off, it will be a massive feather in their cap. Okay, so what about the PlayStation? Well, Sony's backward compatibility supports almost the entirety of the PlayStation 4 catalogue, and there's a handful of games that aren't supported, and Sony do list them on their website. But um, that's it. Unfortunately, Sony have never conquered PlayStation 3 backward compatibility because of the infamous cell processor. The PlayStation 4 simply couldn't crunch through code fast enough to emulate it. Um, while the processor in the PlayStation 5 is much faster, it may be possible, but Sony haven't shown any appetite to do that. Um, what you do have is PlayStation Now available on the console. 
uh, which includes a bunch of PlayStation 3 games that you can stream from Sony's data center. Going back further to the PlayStation 2, Sony did actually release a handful of PlayStation 2 games onto the PlayStation 4 um, using an emulator, but they are listed as PlayStation 4 games and bought as PlayStation 4 games, so I'm not really going to cover those too much, but they do still work if you buy them. In terms of system level enhancements, Sony don't really rival Microsoft's efforts, uh, but there is one very welcome feature to talk about, and that is thanks to Tempest 3D headset audio. One of the perks of Tempest is that it can take multi-channel surround sound audio and virtualize it for any headset, giving you a pretty convincing surround sound experience in your stereo headset. Xbox consoles have been able to do this with Windows Sonic or Dolby Atmos for the whole of the last generation, but on the PlayStation side, it's been a very long time coming and it makes a massive difference over playing these games on the PlayStation 4, if you're a headset user. Right, so I mentioned that both consoles can leverage raw power and speed to help games hit their original performance targets. What I want to show here though is Titanfall 2, because it's a great example of a game that gets more out of it. Titanfall 2 targets 60 frames per second on the previous consoles, but it did that by scaling back the resolution whenever the GPU couldn't keep up. The new consoles can both more than handle the GPU load even when things get really intense, so the result is that the game looks razor sharp. And dynamic scaling isn't particularly common, it's quite a recent trend, so um, it's not in the majority of the games, but when it is there, these consoles can work wonders. We are about 12 minutes into this video now, so hopefully by this point the people that did come in looking for ammunition have got bored and moved on. Which means now we can talk about which console does it best. The answer isn't entirely straightforward because it really depends on the game in question, which sounds obvious, but um, yeah, the system level features only do so much and the quality of the base game on its native platform is still paramount to the experience that you're going to get on the new consoles. There's some pretty clear and obvious trends that favour one platform over the other. So most games released over the last three years included native support for the PlayStation 4 Pro and the Xbox One X. The Xbox One X typically offered higher resolutions than the Pro as well as better textures and effects. Uh, I did a breakdown of Marvel's Avengers in another video and it quite clearly favoured the Series X because of that higher native resolution of the base version. And it's very evident in big games like Red Dead Redemption 2 and Fallout 4 as well. Once you move back further than three years, the script gets turned on its head because the power advantage was with the PlayStation 4 over the Xbox One. So Batman Arkham Knight and Dragon Age Inquisition have featured in this video and they both fit that criteria. They both look noticeably sharper on the PlayStation 5 because of it. The Xbox One was Microsoft's horse in the race for four whole years, so there are loads and loads of games that, uh, that suffer for it as well. The base Xbox One often delivered sub 1080p resolutions and paired back effects, and the Series X backward compatibility doesn't really do anything to fix it. I wouldn't be surprised if Microsoft tried to address that in future, but right now the low resolutions can be fairly jarring. Going back further than that, you have to give a pretty clear win to Microsoft because the Xbox 360 and original Xbox compatibility are a real treat that Sony don't really have any counter for. The footage on screen right now is from Virtual Fighter 5, which was a 360 and PS3 game. So the Xbox footage here is backward compatibility and the PlayStation footage is PlayStation Now streaming. PlayStation Now is not a disaster by any means and its 720p streaming limit is a really good match for PlayStation 3 content. It's all very playable, so long as the game doesn't insist that you press start. For some reason, no button on the DualSense or the DualShock 4 could get me past this obstacle. It's also limited to stereo sound, so you don't get any of the, um, the Tempest virtual surround benefits that I was talking about earlier. And obviously it's a subscription service, which is probably the biggest drawback for a lot of people. <sighs> well, there's more to be said, but I think that's probably enough for one video, isn't it? In closing, I think um, overall it's fair to say that Microsoft's backward compatibility is more ambitious and they're executing it really well. The, the word that I keep coming back to to describe Sony's backward compatibility is competent. So Sony have such a cherished history and the PlayStation 4 has so many phenomenal games that competent is something I'm personally very happy about. But their history goes back much further than that, so I suppose there's a lot of potential for improvement. Uh, final, final note, uh, the brain is really good at correcting what our eyes can see. Some of the differences in the side-by-side -side comparisons might appear quite stark, 
But when I actually played these games in isolation, I didn't perceive much difference between the colors and brightness and things like that. It's only when I put the footage together that the difference became clear. So you could argue it isn't actually that important. Or I suppose you could say that I've wasted hours and hours and hours of time making this video. Or you could just hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and maybe let me know what sort of content you'd like to see next. Hi Mesa, this is Game On Daily. Thank you for your attention and enjoy your gaming.